Why we love the Tang Dynasty. Exploring the unique charm of what's seen by many as the greatest imperial dynasty in Chinese history. Episode 1. Say hello to the Tang Dynasty. I'm Bob Jones, and in this podcast series, we'll be getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it became possibly the most powerful, interconnected and innovative country in the world, with a rich and influential legacy that survives even to this day. If you had to choose a period to describe as the golden age in Chinese history, then you'll find many experts pointing to the Tang Dynasty, which lasted for nearly 300 years, from 618 to 907 AD. During the time of the dynasty, China arguably became one of the most prosperous and influential countries in the world. The splendor of its arts and its cultural environment, along with its scientific achievements, had made it the envy far and wide. This was at a time when Europe was still groveling in the early, middle or dark ages of violence and backwardness. In Western and Central Asia, North Africa and in some parts of Europe, a new religion, Islam, was starting to spread as Arabs began to conquer neighboring lands. Over in the Americas, the local civilizations had to wait another 800 years before they were discovered by the great explorer Christopher Columbus. So how was it that the Tang Dynasty became such an economic and cultural powerhouse, establishing so many of the aspects of Chinese life that we know today? As we walk through the streets of the Tang Dynasty, we would be amazed at how many things are recognizable to us today, not just in terms of the way that people lived their lives, but also in the way they thought and what they believed. It was a prosperous place, a time of unparalleled regional and cultural influence. Trade routes fanned out across Asia, along what we now call the Silk Road, and across the seas too. Tens of thousands of foreigners lived in the major cities of Tang, helping cosmopolitan culture to flourish and introducing new ways of thinking. Many of them even became court officials. Women, as well as men, outside of the aristocratic class, rose to high positions in the civil service. This dynasty even saw the ascendance of the one and only empress in Chinese history, Wu Zetian, not to mention the glories of Tang literature, poetry, calligraphy and painting. But how did this Tang physical and mental prosperity come about? There is a phrase, cometh the hour, cometh the man, which has particular relevance to the founding of the Tang dynasty, or in this case, a series of influential ruling figures who guided the people of the dynasty away from petty factionalism and disunity towards a united and forward-thinking creative prosperity. These emperors created the stability needed for the arts, administration, science and commerce to flourish. Early on, a detailed code of laws was established, building upon the legal practices of previous dynasties. They created a simple-to-understand set of consequences for crimes and specific individual punishments for any violation. In general, people were well behaved, they respected and understood the law, felt safe and slept at night without having to bolt their doors. All these changes were overseen by a new class of clever officials who had encyclopedic knowledge rather than getting their jobs because of their high-born status or who they knew. Crucially, these officials had to pass the all-important Imperial Civil Service Examination, the earliest of its kind in the world. 
Many of the people who made important contributions to the Tang dynasty were selected through this system. And in fact, the government also positively encouraged the people to pursue higher education. The final exam was held once a year in the capital city of Chang'an, already an expansive metropolis at the time. The people of the Tang were becoming city dwellers. These days, that city, now known as Xi'an, is best known perhaps as the home of the world-famous terracotta army. Each year, candidates from all over the country would travel great distances to Chang'an to take the exam. It was quite common for many of them to choose to live in Chang'an to prepare for the exam the next year. Many simply decided to stay on rather than go home, as the distances were so great. But staying in Chang'an was actually a pretty good move. At the time, it rivaled Rome as the biggest city in the world. Plus, it was cosmopolitan, attracting many different nationalities. It was an exciting place of learning and opportunity. It was home to scientists, philosophers, craftsmen, poets, scholars and painters, traders from Central Asia and beyond, each bringing a flavour of their cultures with them. Chang'an was a melting pot of ideas as a result, with academic works from every corner of the known world available to be studied. But how did these foreign books, these ideas, these people reach Chang'an? The Tang capital was sited right at the start of an Asian information and goods superhighway, which we know today as the Silk Road. From the Tang capital, it extended westward for nearly 6,500 kilometers through Central Asia and Southern Europe, finally ending up in Rome. It was teeming with merchants who risked great hardships to transport just about anything you can imagine – textiles, spices, herbs, merchandise, books and most importantly perhaps ideas. We know all this because there exists a wealth of ancient documents recording precise distances from each country along the Silk Road to Chang'an. It was tradition at Chinese New Year for tributes to be displayed in the main square in front of the palace. Some of these tributes were gifts from dependent countries to show that they accepted the Tang Emperor as their overlord or came from different regions within China, or maybe from foreign countries eager to curry favour and increase trade. But since they all had to arrive on time, it was crucial to know distances between places to make a good travel plan. But the Silk Road was by no means a one-way street. The traders of the Tang dynasty also made healthy profits sending fine merchandise out to the wider world. They dispatched silk fabrics, porcelain, musical instruments and lacquerware. Silk was especially popular and was regarded as highly as gold. Advanced technologies such as paper making, scientific instruments, gunpowder, porcelain and woven materials were also exported to other countries. For the Tang Dynasty, the Silk Road had the same kind of influence as the development of the internet today. While the Silk Road was key to international contact during the Tang Dynasty, domestic communication was facilitated by the development of an amazing logistics operation, an empire-wide postal system. At its height, there were about 1,300 postal stations spreading along the roads, one station every five kilometres. It only took two weeks for dispatches to reach the very farthest part of the empire from the capital Chang'an. At its height, there were as many as 20,000 people engaged in this amazing postal system. It was by no means an easy job. Mistakes were punished. If a postal station experienced a delay of even one day, it would be disciplined. Delays in delivering of a document for over six days could come with a punishment of two years' hard labour. Delays in urgent military documents could even lead to losing your head. 
tongue prosperity and the hospitality shown by the emperors to foreigners, their ideas and culture, made it a brilliant era for arts and culture. Emperor Xuanzong, counted as either the seventh or the ninth Tang Emperor, depending on how you count them, okay, so it's complicated. He himself was a talented musician. He not only composed music, but also coached court singers and dancers. Major imperial ceremonies saw a big revival, with ancient orchestras and companies of courtly dancers. The musicians played on bells, stone chimes, flutes, zithers and drums. But it wasn't only the music of the tongue that you'd hear. In an international city like Chang'an, you'd often encounter Arabian and Persian music and dances in the taverns. The Tang Dynasty was also home to some of the most famous poets in Chinese history, whose work children today still recite. But poetry was more than a form of literature in the Tang Dynasty. Writing poems was an important way of socialising. Poets wrote works for when they met, separated and for banquets. They were often inspired by the revelry they saw about them. Everyone wrote poetry. Even the concubines prided themselves on being poets, singers and dancers, and in turn inspired many poems themselves. The Tang Dynasty also produced a great number of prominent calligraphers whose work outshines that of other dynasties, setting the standard for future generations of Chinese practitioners. But their skills were valued even farther afield. Some neighbouring countries, like Japan, chose to learn from the Tang Dynasty, which was regarded at the time as the most advanced and enviable country in the world. Large numbers of young students and monks came from Japan to the Tang Dynasty to learn everything from politics, administration, language, culture, technology and religion. So you see, just like the students from Japan and the traders from every country along the Silk Road, we have much to learn about the amazing Tang Dynasty. Special thanks go out to San Lian Zhongdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Join me again next time. <laughs>